if anyone is thinks that they're not being treated fairly, I think the important thing to do is uh, speak up. You don't have to mm-hmm. be angry about it, but speak up and say, "Look, I don't think this is right. I th- can we can we make some changes?" Hi, I'm Dr. Jed McCosco at AcademicInfluence.com and uh, University of, of Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem. We have another wonderful guest here today. It is Professor Theda Scotchpole. Uh, Theda Scotchpole is, is uh, one of our illustrious influencers on our website, and she has made some time to be with us today to tell all of us how she got her start in her career. So, Professor Scotchpole, can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, well, at this point, I'm a professor of political science and sociology at Harvard University. But of course, I started out a long time ago uh, as a student in Michigan, growing up in the state of Michigan. Uh, My grandparents on both sides were farmers, like lots of people in the United States, and my uh, parents were teachers. And, um, you know, when I was in uh, elementary school and high school in Wyandotte, Michigan, which is right down at the bottom of the of the of the thumb down <laughs> here. Um, I uh, I was known as a smart kid, and that wasn't necessarily such a good thing for a girl fifty years ago. Um, mm. I wasn't all that popular, except when people wanted to copy my Latin homework, and then I oh. was very popular. So I handled all that by getting very interested in books. I I, I checked things out of the library. I read a lot of history. Sometimes I even stayed home from school to read books because uh, I found the classes maybe not as exciting. Uh, But um, I knew by the time it was it was time for me to graduate from high school. It was a 500 person high school class, so it was a large class, I knew that I enjoyed learning and that I wanted to keep uh, learning. So I applied to colleges. I got a scholarship to Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan. And yes, mm-hmm. I did follow the football team at the, <laughs> at the height Good uh, for you. of its glory against Notre Dame back in those Ooh. days. But I, uh, I also uh, was admitted to the Honors College and uh, the nice thing about that was that Michigan State was 40,000 students on one campus, but the Honors College was much smaller, and you got okay. a chance to take classes with professors. In my case, I chose the social sciences, but I also did things in French literature and um, as well as anthropology, sociology, political science. Mm-hmm. Um, all kinds of classes, but most of my classes were small because I was in the uh, honors program. And I did well. Um, By the time I was finishing, I had met my husband, a physicist from uh, from Texas. Yeah, (laughs) physicist. Yeah, and we were actually married as undergraduates at the height of the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement. Did you say he was from Texas? Is that where he he was? He was, but we met in Mississippi. We were okay. we were both uh, volunteers on a Methodist youth program. Yay, Methodists! <laughs> in That's the civil rights <laughs> movement, yeah. And so oh, we, we met and married the summer before we graduated. And wow. he was teaching high school to avoid being drafted for the war. And I was applying for all the scholarships that I could because... Uh, for both of us to go to graduate school, which is what we okay. wanted to do, we had to at least one or both of us win win scholarships so that we could afford it. We were both admitted to Harvard University, and I Yay. knew that I wanted to, um, I used to think of it as stay in school. I really liked being in school. I didn't take a year off the way most undergraduates do now. I just went directly to Harvard University where I was uh, in the sociology department. Oh, so you started uh, off in a sociology PhD program. I did. And, you know, I had already studied a lot of history as an undergraduate and and, Mm -hmm. and political science, and I was in a program where you didn't have to specialize. So for me, sociology was attractive because it kept all my options open. I wasn't necessarily rejecting any other way of understanding um, 
society and politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I enjoyed being in that program at Harvard University. I had teachers like uh, Seymour Martin Lipset and Daniel Bell, and, and um, uh, I learned about Japan from Ezra Vogel in China. Wow. And uh, by the time I was a few years into my graduate program, I became interested in studying revolutions. I took oh. a seminar with Barrington Moore, who was a famous comparative historical sociologist. He was very tough in the classroom. He would go around and ask a question, and if you didn't give the right answer, he'd go to the next student. So <laughs> and kind of give you a sneer, like ah, yeah, you it was known high, that. <laughs> it was highly stressful. But I learned a lot, and oh, good. Uh, I ended up writing a paper comparing the French, Russian, and Chinese revolutions, and that ended up developing into my. PhD thesis. Wow, that must have been a fascinating thesis. Now, is, is that the kind of thesis that you were able to turn into a book afterwards? or I was. And, you know, it was a very risky thesis to do because it was too big a topic, really, uh, mm -hmm. to, for a PhD. A lot of people said, well, maybe you shouldn't do all that. But after I finished the thesis in 1975, I was glad I had because um, it did serve as the basis for a book. And okay. I, over the uh, next year or so, I worked on it some more and developed it further. And it was my first book published in 1979. And it really caught on. A lot of people mm. considered it to be a very important book. States and Social wow. Revolutions, it's called. Um, wow. It laid out a different of kind War. of argument about why revolutions happen. It said it depended yeah. on weakening the military and a split between the landed classes and the military and peasant oh. rebellions. And so uh, I tracked all that for those three countries. Wow. Fascinating. Well, um, just the other day, I think it was just yesterday, we, we interviewed on this same program um, Bruce Bueno de Mesquita, mm -hmm. who, who had some fascinating different insights into why things happen the way they happen. So I'm sure you're familiar with him and with Rogers Smith. We also interviewed right. him and um, a guy from Norway we interviewed as well um, named um, um, Erickson. Um, so, you know, Thomas Erickson. Uh, each of them had a different take in political science. It seems like you're coming really at it from sociology. So how did that change the way um, your career developed. So we, we're, we're at the point where you published your first book. Do you also have your first professor position or where are you at now? I did. I was hired at Harvard University, which is an unusual thing for the university yeah. to hire its own PhD. But it was the height of the feminist movement. And women graduate students were demanding that uh, these departments think about hiring some of their own female PhDs or other PhDs. Yeah. And in my case, I guess because I had professors who knew me, they they hired me along with a couple of others. We were the first women to be hired wow. in the department. Oh my goodness. For a very now, are long you time. Sorry to interrupt you, but we've been interviewing some anthropologists as well. And Louise Lamphere was oh, yes. at Brown University. Okay, I thought you might know her because of the 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 um, tough road she had to hoe to, to uh, yes. fight against Brown when they denied her tenure. Um, so you were right in the thick of all that. That was just around the same time period. It was. And, you know, I was... Um very happy as a, an assistant professor in the sociology department at Harvard. But when it came time for them to judge me for tenure, my book had come out and had won a top prize in the sociology Ooh. field. But they, yeah. they, they had a tie vote and it didn't <gasps> go forward. And so I, um, I'm like Louise Lamphere in a way. I filed one of the first grievances. She filed a lawsuit. I filed an internal grievance of Harvard. Yeah, and she did start with the internal thing. That, yeah. I, I learned that in the interview. You have but yeah, to do She ended that. up having, you had, you had to start with that, and, and then she had to do the lawsuit. But you got, you didn't have to do a lawsuit. You, you were able to get things uh, It never get got to a lawsuit. Out. It took a very long time. And uh, during the interim, I went to the University of Chicago, where I was quite happy for several years. But I oh. did eventually win my case as an internal grievance at Harvard, and I was brought hmm. back with tenure. 
Uh, wow. so, so a lot like Louise Lamphere because she had to leave Brown and go to the University of New Mexico for several years before they solved the case and she got to get her job back. Um, and then she's still at the University of New Mexico because she ended up liking it. But here you are at, in Boston right now. What part of what part of uh, the Boston area do you live in? Cambridge, Cambridge. or further out? You live in Cambridge. Okay, wonderful. Well, and um, right now I'm in Maine, so we have a summer oh, home in Maine, and I love oh. I love New England. So you love all of New England, even though you're from uh, Michigan. Does it kind of remind you of some of the shoreline up at uh, Michigan, Lake Michigan, Lake Superior? Upper Michigan, certainly. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I also love the University of Chicago. I want to be clear. I spent five very happy years there. Okay. So it's a wonderful university. It's very. Uh, intellectual and uh, mm -hmm. people debate across department lines. And in the University of Chicago, I was in the political science as well as sociology department. Oh. So that's when I made the move, really. That was your shift. In a way, yeah. it doesn't matter because, you know, I study politics. I'm interested in how political change happens. And I started out studying revolutions, but in the last period, many years, I've been studying uh, reform movements in oh. uh, and social movements in America and in, in, in the Western world. So okay. I don't study the same topic all the time. I look okay. at political change and how it happens in different settings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I can imagine that because we interviewed Don Green yesterday, and he, uh, as you know, is at Columbia but was long time at Yale, and uh, he talked about how his his research has changed quite a bit over the yes. years. Yes. And it sounds like that's what you're saying too. Um, maybe you could give us a few examples of uh, the reforms that you've studied in the United States, because I'm sure um, unlike the politics in China and, and France and, and Russia, most of the students that listen to this interview might be familiar with some of the um, reforms that you studied. Yeah, you know, I, I wrote about the rise of um, social welfare policies in the United States. And oh. many years I set, ago, I set out to look at the New Deal, which is when we got the social security system mm -hmm. and unemployment insurance, the kinds of things that we still have to the present day. But I got interested in an earlier period, and I discovered that in 19th and early 20th century America, there were very generous pensions that were oh. given to the Union soldiers who won the Civil War. Oh. They didn't go to the Southern soldiers. They went to the Northern soldiers. Okay. But they were so generous that by the early 20th century, they were like old age pensions and disability payments. And at that oh. point, the former Confederate states created their own systems, but they were not as generous because the Confederate states were much poorer yes. at that time. So yes. uh, that book became called Protecting Soldiers and Mothers. I discovered in that work uh, that the first big social policies in the United States were for veteran soldiers. And then in the early 20th century, there were women's movements that created programs for mothers and children. From mothers the government? Mothers' pensions, they were called. Interesting. Wow. And so I really discovered a whole new trajectory for American social programs and realized that they didn't just start with the New Deal. Uh -huh. uh, more recently, I've studied health care policy. So I've studied, wow. uh, I wrote a book about the rise and fall of the Clinton health plan back in the 1990s mm -hmm. and a book about mm -hmm. Obamacare, about mm -hmm. how Two it passed. Two separate books. Yes, how mm -hmm. it passed and, and what the obstacles have been to carrying it out fully because, of course, it's still controversial. In America, very kind. Of, it's going to be coming up in this election, whether you it know comes up in every or... election. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. So you have the book on it. So we should read that book, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you are, you are truly one of the most influential political scientists, and it's no surprise that you just love what you do. I, I'm not surprised to find out that from when you were young, you just loved learning. You loved that process, and it sounds like. You love Harvard. You love the New, New England area, the students at Harvard. Um, so that yes. must be really rewarding to In get fact, to be the there again. the most interesting recent thing that happened is that uh, my students and I are working on American politics now. And I wrote mm -hmm. a book about the Tea Party where I went out and actually talked face to face with Tea Party people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then more recently, some of my undergraduate students, I think your listeners might be, find this interesting. They wrote senior theses by going back to their home states. One of them lives 
comes from North Carolina, and she mm-hmm. wrote Bust, about Bust changes in the Republican Party in North Carolina, and another one went to Michigan and asked why Trump won Michigan, which was a surprise. Wow. And another one went to Florida, and mm-hmm. others went to Texas. And we put it all together in a book where I have a number of chapters that I wrote, and um, my students, including my undergraduate students, uh, adapted their prize-winning senior theses to be chapters in the book. Wow, so they actually got to write a book. And I love it when the students get interested in doing research of their own. Wow. Well, you know, I I have five kids and a few of them want to go to Harvard. So it'll be interesting to see if they end up having you as a professor. Do you plan on teaching there for several more years? Oh, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, good. Oh, good. You know, we need people like you. So, you know, as, as we kind of wrap up this interview, um, one theme that I've been really coming across as I do these interviews um, is that there was a lot of uh, uh, sexism, sexism uh, sexual discrimination, I guess you'd call it, um, back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, even 80s. Um, you faced that. And I guess what, what sort of lesson do you want to pass on to people now who feel discriminated against? Including women. I mean, I don't. I don't think women are out of the woods yet. I mean, from what I can gather with my wife, my daughters, um, there's still so much there. And then, of course, that doesn't even count all the other forms of discrimination. So, so tell us what we should know if we're if we are not like me, not white and male, but we fall into somebody else, some of these well, other sometimes categories. Sometimes even white males are treated badly in the workplace. So, I mean, if you if anyone is thinks that they're not being treated fairly, I think the important thing to do is. Uh, speak up. You don't have mm-hmm. to be angry about it, but speak up and say, "Look, I don't think this is right. I th- can we can we make some changes? Try to build mm-hmm. ships to the people you're asking to change, so that they don't feel too threatened in the process. Mm-hmm. Don't uh, be shy to ask for change and use whatever mechanisms there are, especially working with other people, because it works mm-hmm. a lot better if you're speaking up along with others." Uh, but my yes. own story is an interesting one. You know, I had a pretty bitter fight with Harvard University about my tenure, but I eventually prevailed. And after some years went by, some of the people who had been very opposed came around. So they're your friends now? Or they, were? they would come up to me and quietly say, you know, I was wrong about this. Oh, that's and so rewarding. I would simply smile and say thank you. Good for you. You're I you're definitely the bigger person. I didn't try to make a big fuss about mistakes that happened in the past. So mm-hmm. you have to be determined and tough and stick up for yourself, but you also have to be ready to be constructive when the change starts to happen. And forgiving. Like, I guess you must have yeah. learned in your Methodist upbringing, you know, forgive yeah. others. That's always <laughs> served me well. Well, good for you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it, Professor Scotchpole. And we, we look forward to um, seeing what other amazing people um, take the same path that maybe you've taken. Oh, through. I bet a lot of your students at Wake Forest will do that. Yes. And, and this interview will be watched by people all over the world. So oh, hopefully, good. Well, you not, know, not uh, just at uh, my I institution. think it, it's possible for anyone. I put it out in a pretty, uh, pretty humble circumstances. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm.